Well, please rise and join us in worship. As high as the heavens are over the earth, wider than ever we see. Love without borders, grace beyond words, your heart runs with a deep. You are holy, good. There is no end to your mercy, and your love will not run dry.
So I uh, had a really cool joke last Sunday, and I didn't bring it this Sunday because um, we have double dippers, okay? So we got people that go to the traditional at eight, and then come over here, and I didn't want to be throwing out material that I've already had there, so I've kind of scaled it back a little bit, all right? And it goes like this. You got the, uh, the Jewish rabbi, all right? You got the Catholic priest, and you got the Lutheran minister, all right? And they're in Milwaukee, and they walk into a bar. And bartenders, you know, doing the, they're always doing the thing with the cup, the glass, you know. And he looks up, is this a joke? <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. He took a sec, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really did look up some jokes this morning, and they were just long and detailed and really getting into theology. And I'm like, well, I guess that would be Lutheran, right? Getting into theology <laughs> over the punchline. Folks. Oh. We got to, we got to, the, the scripture, whoa, almost went too far there. Uh, so going off of, since I'm, you know, mostly down at that side, uh, going off the lectionary, so third of Epiphany, and third of Epiphany brings us Mark 1, 14 through 20, but it's a good one because it, well, and it's kind of a repeat of last week, which was the disciples. It's the disciples again. So here's the reading from the Gospel of Mark. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Folks, Good passage here. Of course, obviously, well, discipleship, chaplain or pastor? Yeah, ch discipleship. You got it. <laughs> We're going to look at that a little bit. Now, I do during the week, and this is not a plug for the little show we do, uh, I do a uh, weekly devotional each day. And for the last two weeks, the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, and I think it's based on kind of the spiritual reality that I think is going on around us. You know, like, you know, Pilgrim's Progress had this kind of it was describing the spiritual life, you know, and the mountains and the valleys, right? And the things he would face. So kind of with, you know, the spiritual world around us in mind, it's kind of chaos, right? It, it really is. It's just nuts out there. Not just well and spiritual, but in the real world too. And so the Lord was putting on my heart all week and my wife was like, why do you keep doing these? But they were stories of individual soldiers. All right, now that doesn't surprise you. That's what I've done for the past 23 years of their experience on Omaha Beach. D-Day, remember? Saving Private Ryan, the first 30 minutes. Uh, the first 30 minutes that made, uh, when World War II vets went to watch the movie, they were re-traumatized after, you know, 60 years and had to go back to the docks. Okay, these are stories. And I was like, the Lord's like, yeah, use these stories and then take these individual stories and the reality that these men saw as far as in a spiritual aspect and, and just bring it home. Maybe we could understand faith a little bit when things are just crazy. So, and it, it was, it's really kind of cool. Some of these, it's amazing. And because we're talking, there were several thousand men. These guys that survived, you know, eventually they said, hey, well, there I was and this was happening and this was happening. And so we've, we've been doing that. And I tell you what, folks, it truly is amazing. But I want to kind of bring it in a little bit for a second here uh, because there's an important aspect that's going on here. You know, first of all, on D-Day, uh, as I was looking at this, I realized, well, wait a minute here. These are just low-ranking guys. I mean, there were no generals on the beach, you know, General Patton wasn't walking across the beach. Follow me, guys. Let's go through here, okay? 
He wasn't. Eisenhower wasn't there. Bradley wasn't there. All the major gen- Guess where they were? In the back. On a boat somewhere. Patton was in England still. Now, don't get me wrong. You look at some of the maps. They had a really good plan, folks. A really good. There were arrows everywhere, okay, right? Little numbers. There were uh, little boxes with little symbols in. I mean, you look at this. This was planned. Very nice plan, all right? And not only that is all these guys at their different elements practiced this for like two months before it happened. They would have fake little boats that, you know, the ramp went down and, all right, we're all going to the left. You're going to the right. We're, we're doing a combat roll halfway across the beach. I mean, they rehearsed this stuff. So technically right here, they knew everything that was supposed to happen when they got into the chaos. Well, as you know, if you've watched the movie, and uh, the second that ramp literally went down, that whole plan with the neat little arrows and the sticky notes was gone was literally gone. And this time, there were no generals there watching it to say, oh, oh, just in case this, do this. It was up to these guys to now make this happen. And again, as you notice from the movie, it was mass chaos, right? I mean, these guys, half of them didn't even make it to where they were supposed to be. The other half that made it to this little protective seawall It's weird, that's where the water stops when the tide comes in. Push the dirt up just high enough. It must have been God, I I don't know. Just high enough for all these guys to hunker down. And they got there, and at first it was like, what's going on? Where's my guys? I went left, and nobody else went left with me. I mean, they're sitting there, they're just total confusion. What's going on? What do we do? And as the reality sunk in, as, 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 you know, what became minutes became possibly hours, of just hunkered down there, they were like, all right, I could either die on this beach, I could run back to the water and probably die, or the only other option is to go forward. And then one guy would look at another and say, hey, are you getting the same idea I am? Go forward. And they'd be, yeah, I'm getting the same idea. And then they'd look down, hey, you know, let's just go forward. You know, it's best to do this. Just ordinary guys, all right? We're talking everywhere from a little private that, you know, is brand new in the army. A few captains here and there, okay. There was no generals, all right. And they sat there a little bit longer, and they're like, well, you know, I've got this little explosive thing here. If I push it through the wire, it'll blow a hole in it, and we can get through there. And everybody's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. Another guy's like, well, I have this really cool, you know, rifle. I can put down suppressive fire for us so they don't shoot at you. And they're like, yeah, do that. And now I'm simplifying this a lot, folks, okay? You know, (laughs) in chaos, it's a lot different. And there's words that we're not supposed to say in church. But (laughs) but all these guys started getting these ideas like, okay, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do this. They came together, and then they made it happen. They acted. Just simple, ordinary soldiers. Again, nobody had general in front of their name. All right. Nobody had senior master tactician behind their name where all the little alphabet letters go, you know. It was just a bunch of guys that said, we got to do something. We got to get off this beach. They hunkered down. They grabbed whatever courage, bravery, valor they had within their bones still and just did it. And within a few hours after all these little people started moving up through the, through the defenses, it was pretty much a foothold. And a foothold became a larger foothold, you know. And then it's all history from there. You know, within the year, World War II comes to an end in Europe. Just amazing. It just, it stands out. So, but this whole thing, just ordinary guys. It wasn't the, it's not the generals who are the, you know, the most experienced, the, the truly capable, the people we would expect to be winning the wars. They just make the plans. It's all the little people, right? The little guys. Uh, any, everywhere from the front infantry guy all the way back, believe it or not, to the cook who's feeding that infantry guy. It all comes to play. And thus, success, you know, on June 6th there, 1944. So, we are going to find out how this applies to discipleship. Trust me. Um, in today's passage today, what did we have? Okay, what we have going on in today's passage 
And Mark, when it comes to Mark, Mark is very matter of fact. He's the guy that's not going to, you know, fluff the gospel. All right, he's only got, he's got, he's got 16 chapters he's got to do this in, folks. It's not like Matthew that's got like 28 or something, or, all right, he's got to get this done in 16 chapters, all right, so it's action, action, action. Jesus did, Jesus went, Jesus saw, Jesus prayed. And if you read through it, it's like, well, this is going pretty quick. I mean, we're in the first chapter, and we already have, you know, a baptism, we have calling the disciples, and we even have like two or three miracles still in the first chapter. Wow. Jesus is moving. He's getting things going. But at the very beginning of this little passage there, we see that, oh, John the baptism gets put in prison. And then Jesus moved into Galilee, preaching repent for the kingdom of God is coming at hand. And also saying the time has come. What we have going on here, folks, is literally the end of John the Baptist's ministry, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's go, go, go from there. And uh, I love it. It's the time has come. Uh, Some translations go, the time has been fulfilled. Meaning, salvation history has started. This whole thing from old old covenant to new covenant, salvation for the world has just begun. And uh, that's what we see Jesus doing. Now, last Sunday, if you were on the other side, this is a recap, so you guys will get it. Uh, we kind of looked at the fact that Jesus used very unconventional wisdom. He really did. If you know anything about the Gospels, all through the Gospels, you will always notice, for some reason, Jesus is always at odds with the leaders, right? The experts, always. It, it, It never fails. And not only that, but he flips the entire system on its head. A good example is, Back then, the system of dealing with other people was eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I mean, something, somebody did something to you, you did it back to them. You know, so you always had this constant struggle going. That was just the culture back then. And then Jesus comes along and says, I would say, love your neighbor. What? What are you to pray for? My, um, love your enemy, sorry. <laughs> yeah, love your neighbor, folks. That's a, <laughs> pray for your enemy, love your enemy. And everybody's like, what is he talking about? He was always flipping the system, you know, basically showing this is what the Bible's, about. this is what the Word of God is about. It's not what culture's doing, it's what God is doing. So it's pretty cool. So unconventional wisdom, you know, if we were, if we were sitting there watching Jesus pick his disciples, we would be like, whoa, wait a minute here. Because you see, Jesus didn't start his ministry by going to some, you know, retreat where he learned the basic, you know, leadership skills of how to build a multinational ministry, right? You don't see that. He doesn't go and, you know, uh, do a selective process where he, you know, has people send resumes in for a whole year and then says, all right, these 12 guys are the best we got here. You know, it'll count. No. What do we see Jesus do? He simply is walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Sees some fishermen. Go figure that. All right. Looks at them. Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Okay, and this is what's going to be the big multinational evangelical association here? Yes. Wow. Ordinary men. The whole situation was ordinary. First of all, fishermen, we can agree, ordinary guys, just fishermen. All right? Ordinary time? It was just the middle of the day. Folks, it wasn't like a Sunday or a special holiday, you know, where he brought everybody into church kind of as a, as a landmark launch point for his ministry. It was just simply a regular, ordinary day. That's it. Comes, he interacts with these guys. Come, follow me. Ordinary place, ordinary time, ordinary people. So it's, I was already setting the stage where I think I see where God's going with this whole disciple thing and this whole ministry thing. Back in those days, if you wanted to learn from a rabbi, which Jesus was considered a rabbi, you went to him and you stayed at his special school. And you learned and eventually were launched off to be a rabbi somewhere else. And you'd go out and sit on some rock in the desert, you know, or, you know, go to the temple and sit on a rock there. And people would come to you. No, Jesus went out amongst the people, the ordinary people. 
It speaks volumes, folks. It speaks volumes of where this ministry is going here. Oh. Uh, if I look back, um, coming back into kind of my ministry, and I wanted to share this uh, a little bit, um, I noticed as a, a, as a chaplain in the military, I, I, a lot of times now you, uh, let me put it this way, a lot of times now you go to these seminars, right, and their special speaker will be like some special forces guy, right? Special forces, you know, Delta Force, right? Marine reconnaissance sniper guy. He's here to tell you about, okay? And you're like thinking to yourself, it seems to be everybody in the army or military, except me was like special forces. <laughs> Folks, I always thought about that. It's like, well, Lord, I didn't really do a lot of really cool, cool stuff like that. I mean, there was some cool stuff, don't get me wrong. But I was a chaplain, a chaplain. Had a signal battalion first, which really in the military world, that's the radio guys, guy, you know? It really wasn't like, wow. Now, I did have a cavalry squadron, which was, wow. Okay, don't get me wrong. But I was like, you know, but no, I was never special forces, guys. I mean, <laughs> what's going on here, Lord? And then the Lord reminded me of something. What I was just preaching. I used the ordinary, folks. I used the ordinary. That's what's going to reach out and touch the people that are around you. Now, there's something about the ordinary that's very important in our message today as we look at the scripture passage. So Jesus, when he looked at these fishermen, he saw something a little bit deeper than I think we would. Because like I said, what does conventional wisdom say? Not the best choice, okay? But what was he looking at? He was looking at the heart, right? He was looking at the heart. The first test of this came when he looked at them and literally said to them, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible says, well, they went home. They, you know, weighed the pros and cons charts, right? They prayed for like three weeks about it, you know. They, set us, they, they, they got everything set up to where, you know, the family would be taken care of in the business. No. Immediately, they dropped the nets. I feel sorry for Zebedee there, remember? Zebedee's sitting in the boat going like, whoa, whoa, guys, where are you going? Sons, I was, putting, I was gonna retire next week, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. Immediately they followed him. So he knew their hearts. He knew their hearts that they would follow and they would obey and they would execute and they would desire what Christ had. So that's awesome. But I think something else he also knew. The cool thing about how when God uses us is, did you know that God uses each and one, every one of our particular skill sets? He really does. The good example is in a fisherman. All right? I'm gonna, I, I kind of dug into this a little bit because I thought, well, that's interesting. What do fishermen have, you know, that would, you know, help with going out and winning souls for Christ. Now, the terminology was pretty cool, right? Jesus got that done. Come, you know, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so, oh, Jesus is talking our talk here, you know? I mean, if it was a bunch of construction workers, it would come and let's build the house of the Lord. It was been something like that, you know? I mean, Jesus just knew what was going on here. His plan was going to come into play here. Uh, like I said, he didn't need the scholars. He didn't need the special little letters after the names, all right, because he was going to use something that was more effective in reaching people than just, you know, hey, I'm an expert in this, I'm an expert in this. All right, so check this out. This is pretty cool. Um, and I kind of got this list from a, another pastor, and I said, that's a pretty good list. It's kind of something to go off of here. So if you're a fisherman, you got to be diligent, right? You, and if you look at fishermen, and it, like it says even in the scripture there, they were mending their nets. Do you know when you have downtime as a fisherman, you're not enjoying the beach, guys. You're not just chilling out there on the waves. There's always something that has to be done, all right? They were diligent in their job. They were fixing the nets all the time, making sure there were no holes in it. They were making sure the boat was, was seaworthy all the time. Those sails needed to be fixed a lot, you know, mended. They were always out there being able to, to, to address their profession. Diligence. Uh, I would say patience is probably a big thing, right? I mean, it's not like you can just give, put fish on a timetable to swim into a net, 
All right, you, I mean, that's, I don't know if anybody could do that, but they're patient. Okay, well, we got to put the net in here and we may have to wait a while. We don't know where the fish are. You know, and you just wait and they come in, you got enough, you pull it up. So there was patience. Uh, insight, there was some insight because once you were probably out on the Lake of Galilee there for, you know, two or three years, you probably knew like at five in the morning, the best place to go is probably over there. So you'd, you know, get your boat out, you'd go over there, sure enough, you'd probably pull fish out. So they had some insight. Uh, they had perseverance, okay? There were times when you'd throw the net in, and if anybody's been out fishing, there's times you just don't get a bite. So you've got to go to the next spot, and the next spot. They finally get, and it's many times in the gospel, it talks about they're fishing and nothing. They come up dry. So they had perseverance. They kept to it. Uh, and they had courage, now, I know there's some stories in the Bible where that courage wavers, but you're out there on... Folks, the Sea of Galilee is not like Watson Lake, all right? So if that's what you're thinking when you think of the Sea of Galilee, it was huge. We're talking, you know, you could barely see the other side. So when a storm came in, guess what? A storm came in. You were tossed to and fro. Many times in the Bible, the bo their courage wavered because their boats being tossed so bad, they thought, this is it. It's over. We're done. We're going to sink right here in the middle of the water. You see? But the, so there had to be some courage that went into it. Um, and then uh, the guy listed faith, but I know many times, if you remember many of the stories, Jesus is always saying, your faith is less, is little. <laughs> you know, oh, ye of little faith. So, I mean, that's, that's debatable. But you do have to have faith when you're catching fish. If you throw it in, hopefully you're going to pull something out. But you can kind of see where a lot of these little, uh, these skill sets they had could definitely come into play out fishing for men and women. All of these places go. I mean, you got to be diligent. You're not going to go out there and suddenly save 30 people just by walking into a coffee shop, right? You know, you have to persevere. You may have to go to two or three coffee shops, okay? You may have to avoid Starbucks and go to another place, all right? It's just... You can see where these skill sets come to play in early Judea back in the day when you were out there doing ministry, doing the work of the Lord. I think it's amazing. Now, here's the cool thing that brings it all home. All right, those were the apostles, the first. Folks, as I read this Bible and understand the plot and get further towards Acts, um, you know, Jesus, he died, rose again, ascended into heaven, right? Right? So he's not on the ground anymore. He leaves it to the apostles now, the disciples. And what's their job? To take the gospel to the entire world. And I'm telling you what, 12 guys, the entire world, that's a lot of space. That's a lot of space. But what happened? Every time they went to a little village, a synagogue, right? Every time they were on the street in the marketplace preaching the gospel, one by one, ordinary people responded and said, I want that. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Their lives were transformed, right? Not just the apostles, the lives of everybody that they touched. And those people in turn did what? went to their friends and say, hey, my life's transformed. You got to see this. Listen to what this says. And they spread Jesus on. Ordinary people. That's how the gospel is spread around the world. That's how lives are touched in all of our communities. In the United States, in Prescott, Arizona, that's how lives are touched. You know, if you run the numbers versus the population of pastors versus the population, it's not a lot, okay? We don't have a, our influence, we preach at church, I got it. We go out, we do some visits. But folks, it's the people that we touch, that Christ has touched, that the Holy Spirit uses, what? To minister and bring the word of God to the lost, the hurting the backslidden, right? And the beautiful thing is this. Because here's what happens. I believe that all of us good Christians coming to church, you know, and stuff, 
we want to serve God. We really do. We want to be involved in some way, shape, or form, right? We want to do, you know, what the Lord is telling us to do. And of course, there's the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, have you ever run from the Holy Spirit? Come on, has anybody ever tried to run from the Holy Spirit? It's not fun, folks. He bugs you like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> he really does. He's poking you. Hey, do this, do this. Like, stop poking me, okay? It really is like that. It's just, you cannot escape his influence in your life. But a lot of times we, we come up with the, well, I'm not a pastor, right? Or I haven't read the whole Bible yet, Lord. Or I don't have that special, special degree from this Bible college. I'm not qualified to go and minister to someone. Well, what have I said? I believe that Jesus uses our skill sets to reach out to the people around us. My mom is a, a, a phenomenal lady. I mean, my mom, you know, I got to do it's on camera, right? <laughs> She's a great lady, and she has got this gift of hospitality. Now, early on, she didn't realize it, but she, once she started having these like huge parties, right? Just because she invited a few friends over, and next thing you know, it's huge. The Holy Spirit showed her, "Oh, you've got the gift of hospitality. We're using that." Oh, she brings people in all the time, reaches people all the time because she understands, hey, I'm getting all these people to my house. Maybe some of them need to be ministered to. Maybe someone needs to know the Lord. Perfect. That's an avenue that God uses. And of course, you can take your own life and your own skill sets and put it into perspective. All right? I mean, we can go on with examples all day. Just remember, it's your skill sets with you when you have an open heart to him. That's saying, Lord, use me. It's those skill sets that are in you that he's going to use. I mean, he's not going to wait for the Pope to come walking down the street and, you know, transform Prescott into, you know, this big, huge, you know, Mecca of Christianity. No. Just like I said at the beginning, you know, that beach, it was taken by the guys. <laughs> All right? Not by the generals. Our city, in the spiritual sense, is reached through all of us, all of us ordinary people. Because your circles are bigger than just mine. I, don't, I only have a few circles, you know. I mean, the pastor of caring ministry here, I mean, if I went just by the job description, I'd simply be just overseeing the, the shut-ins, you know what I'm saying? That's it. Now, that, now what, what am I supposed to do about the cops? You know, what am I supposed to do about the music world, you know? I don't have those circles. Well, guess what, folks? <laughs> You're out there in the world every single day. It's chaotic. I know it is. I really do. But you know that Jesus has your back, right? And you know that Jesus is wanting to use each and every one of us to reach the people around us. And if you've prayed, Lord, use me, guess what's going to happen? He's going to use you. I promise you. And again, if you pray that same prayer, the Holy Spirit's going to poke you and say, do, do, do. Folks, you the easiest way to do it is just give in and say, Holy Spirit, use me. Show me, guide me. Show me what skill sets I can use to reach the people that are hurting. They're all around us, folks. Folks, to kind of sum this up, God will use us just as we are. Where we are, okay, and when we are. We're not waiting for some special thing to happen. It's in the here and the now that God is going to use us. Amen.